The Mongol Empire had, under the leadership of Chinggis Khan, known to us as Genghis Khan, transitioned from a series of often squabbling tribes nestled in the Mongolian steppes to by 1206 a unified entity. Genghis Khan would die in 1227, but his lands would be enlarged and further consolidated by his descendants. One of those, his grandson, Hushe Han, or Kublai Khan, who would expand the empire to its greatest extent. The Mongol Empire would grow with spectacular military successes, crushing kingdoms in all direction under hoof and arrow. The savagery and mobility with which the Mongol forces carried out their expansion was without equal to that point in time. The Mongols' mobility born out of the steppes, a byproduct of their nomadic lifestyle. While the horses they rode were not the fastest, each Mongol rider would often have several and rotate between them so they all got a break from being mounted. They could cover up to 160 kilometers or 100 miles per day and as a result could descend fast and unpredictably, like a storm distant on the horizon one moment, then a sweeping maelstrom directly overhead the next. Along with their successes, there would also be some spectacular failures. One of those would be the small isolated island nation of Japan. They would send the winds of war Japan's way, and Japan would counter with a storm of defiance. The Japanese had managed to avoid direct contact and conflict with the Mongol Empire, as they had no official diplomatic relations with either of their direct neighbors, China or Korea. Other than trade and raiding, they kept to themselves and their own affairs. The Mongols, though, had heard of Japan as being a land of much gold and riches. Marco Polo had written this about Japan. The people on the island of Zipangu have measureless quantities of gold. The king's palace is roofed with pure gold and the floors are paved in gold two fingers thick. This account was likely known to the Khan as Japan as a source of gold production had been well known to the rulers of China. There are written accounts that previous delegations from China in earlier centuries had returned home with kilogram upon kilograms of gold. These and other accounts all contributed to the legend of Japan as a land of gold, but in fact, Japan was more a land of silver. The Khan may have also had other more personal reasons for the invasion. In 1266, Kublai Khan sent two envoys to Japan with a letter stating that the two countries should establish friendly relations. However, there were statements made in the letter that, while perhaps common for the Mongols, the Japanese perceived as insulting, the mention of their emperor as a mere king for one and the veiled hints at becoming a tributary vassal state, the other. The most egregious, though, perhaps, was the last paragraph, which seemed to imply the threat of war for non-compliance. The end result of this first official contact would be envoys returning back empty-handed, as would a second set of envoys in 1268, and additional ones sent in 1269, 1271, and 1272, but those Japan would not even allow to land on their shores. Japan had since the late 1100s been ruled by a military dictatorship located in Kamakura under the control of the Hojo. The emperor, whose court resided in Kyoto, was functionally more of a figurehead. The emperor Kamiyama's chamberlain had written an edict stating that an Inui curse would be levied against the Mongols. This, coupled with the later tsunami storm, would lay the foundation for future divinity legends surrounding the protection of Japan. The Japanese culture would continue to meld divinity and nature as they had since their animist past, even under Buddhism and Shintoism. The samurai was also likened to cherry blossoms, as his life, while glorious, was prone to sudden end during military service, similar to petals shed by cherry blossoms. As indicated previously, the real power in Japan lay with the Kamakura shogunate, Technically under the shogun, but in reality its de facto head was Hojo Tukimune, who had inherited the title as the sixth reigning Hojo Shikin or regent from his father in 1256 due to his father's failing health. Neither the Khan nor the Hojo would directly take part in the fighting that was to come. Two armies 
that differed considerably in appearance, tactics, and armaments. While both prided themselves as horseback archers, their approach to it was very different. The samurai firing the arrows on horseback were heavily armored in the 13th century, and they rode smaller horses than the Mongols did. While the Mongols also had heavy cavalry, their archers tended to be organized in a looser configuration than their Japanese counterparts, and they were more light cavalry armor-wise. The Mongols would deliver their also shorter arrows in huge volleys from their ranks, whereas the Japanese method was to send but a single arrow against a chosen and hopefully worthy opponent to earn him honor and glory on the battlefield. The tactical formation of the Japanese was more warband in approach, with each led by a prominent samurai and his followers. As mentioned, the Japanese would traditionally send the single arrow with a special signaling tip that would whistle as it flew to initiate the combat. The Mongols, meanwhile, fought with more rank-and-file structure, often using drums to signal battlefield maneuvers. They had also access to Chinese inventions such as exploding grenade-like bombs made of both paper and iron and delivered by catapults. These were among the first examples of gunpowder explosions heard in Japan. The samurai arms and armor consisted of the following. An armor called yoroi. It was made from small scales tied together and lacquered, then combined into armor plates by binding them together with silk, cords, or ones made of leather. This created a flexible defensive armor capable of absorbing the high-impact energy of enemy blows. Both iron and leather were used as a fully iron suit was deemed too heavy. Thus, the iron was used for the most protective portions of the armor. The body of the Yoroi armor consisted of four main sections, two large shoulder plates fastened at the back by a large ornamental bow, with two guards to protect the tying cords from being cut. Then there were the arm sections that provided free movement while keeping the body covered. Next was the helmet made from iron plates, fastened together with large projecting conical rivets, with the neck protected via a heavy five-piece neck guard. Some samurai would also wear face masks. Generally, the shooting arm was kept armor-free to more easily allow arrows to be fired quickly and efficiently. Each samurai would also have a sword forged by a celebrated master, and it was one of the most prized gifts that a samurai could receive from a leader. These swords were almost reaching their zenith of perfection by the time of the Mongol invasions. Their long, curved blades were razor-sharp and could cut deeply into the brigandine-like coats of enemies like the Mongols. Lastly, the Japanese bow. They were longer bows made out of deciduous wood and backed with bamboo for added reinforcement. They were lacquered to weatherproof them and used bamboo arrows. On horseback, the bow was held high to the head to clear the horse, with the drawing hand pulled back to the ear. In contrast, the Mongol army, while often said to have been lightly armored, was in fact very diverse. While the common soldiers and horseback archers were more lightly armored, the Mongols also had contingents of heavy cavalry units who appear depicted in the Japanese Mongol invasion scrolls. The lighter armor worn by those lighter units formed the foundation for all units, including the heavier armored ones. It was a heavy coat fastened by a leather belt at the waist, which also carried the sword, dagger, and sometimes even an axe. Boots were stout but comfortable and made from felt and leather. The head covered in a hat made of felt and fur. The heavier armored units had over top of this a coat made in the Asiatic style of lumeler armor, which consisted of small scales of iron or leather or combined, and then pierced with holes and sewn together via leather thongs. They wore helmets made from a number of large iron pieces shaped roughly into a conical shape and featured iron-plated neck guards, much like the samurai armor. The heavy cavalry horses would likewise be protected by lumeler armor. Mongol bows were shorter than the Japanese ones. They were composite reflex bows in design made from yak horn, sinew, and bamboo glued together into a single set piece. The bow was strung against the natural curve, giving it an exceptionally strong pull. Each archer typically carried multiple bows and a quiver with both regular and poison-tipped arrows. They also carried rounded wooden shields for personal protection, and their swords were slightly curved and saber-like in design. 
By 1271, the Mongols had dealt successive blows to the Chinese Song dynasty south of the growing Mongol Empire. The impact of this was the symbolic transition of the Mongol Empire from nomadic dwellers in tents to the more sedentary rulers of a civilized state. The Mongols had crept even closer to Japan by initiating an invasion of Korea in the year 1231. Despite valiant efforts by both its military and civilians, the Mongol attacks were relentless. There were moments of peace, but over the decades, the Mongols would send in wave after wave, and eventually, by 1259, the Koreans, battle-weary, capitulated. By the year 1273, the Mongols had unified their Korean invasion by marrying themselves into the Korean royal family. They would now have two separate coastal areas with which to launch an invasion against Japan. Numbers for the invasion fleet and the Japanese defenders for the first invasion attempt vary wildly. The likely numbers for the Mongol expedition force, likely 30,000 strong with hundreds of ships. The Japanese force, based on the number of samurai band and average number of each, indicated that their force is likely numbered between 4 and 8,000. This would indicate a ratio of Mongol to Japanese of roughly 6 to 1. The invasion fleet set sail on the 2nd of November 1274 from the southern end of the Korean Peninsula. They first reached the island of Tsushima, which is featured in the video game Ghost of Tsushima. The island consisted of two main islands separated by a narrow strait. The Mongols would use a two-pronged assault, hitting both islands via four places on its western coast. Each island they attacked at two spots, with the main bulk of their force hitting the southern island at Sasura. Their vessels spotted by islanders on the evening of the 4th of November. This provided the island's deputy Jido, a man by the name of Sosuke Kuni, with some time to hastily scramble together a defense. The Japanese were superstitious in the sense they believed in kami, or spirits and omens. On the day the Mongols approached, a shrine dedicated to Hachiman, the god of war, caught on fire. While the fire was quickly extinguished, supposedly as messengers were to deliver news of this as a bad omen. Just then, a flock of white doves landed upon the shrine's roof, and it was then instead interpreted as a warning, not as a disaster. Skikuni's command consisted of 80 mounted samurai warriors and their followers. He led them over a mountain pass at night to take up positions near the Mongol main assault landing force at Sasura. It must have been a tense wait for dawn. For dawn, however, would not arrive before the Mongols. At roughly 2 a.m. they landed, and intense ferocious fighting would break out at 4 a.m. Skikuni had taken an interpreter along to see if discourse with the Mongols was possible, but it was not as the Mongol reply would be a volley of arrows fired overhead as a thousand of their warriors from the beachhead charged the Japanese. Skikuni had his samurai return a volley of arrows back, and their precision archery managed to kill many of the Mongols, but yet they charged. As the fighting raged on the beaches, two Japanese boats managed to slip through the Mongol fleet to take a message to the rest of the Japanese islands that the war had started. Saito Skesada, one of Skekuni's closest men, had enthusiastically attacked and killed a high-ranking senior Mongol officer who along with his group had gotten stuck in a grove of beachside trees. The Mongols returned fire at him, first with a stone-hurling catapult, then a volley of arrows, three of which pierced deeply into his chest. Half of Skikuni's followers would die from the overwhelming Mongol numbers, but even as their number dropped below half and then a quarter, they fought on bravely until all, including Skikuni, were dead. The Mongols would set fire to every building in the vicinity and slaughter most of the inhabitants. They would spend another nine days securing the island before leaving to head for the smaller island of Iki to the south on the 13th of November. The deputy Jido there a man by the name of Taira Kagetaka was said to have hailed from the family by the same name that was defeated during the Genpai War. Kagetaka had received word of the coming Mongols while he was at his castle headquarters. He immediately sent urgent word to Dezaif on the main South Island of Japan for reinforcements. 
Kagetaka and his followers fought similarly on the beaches when the Mongols landed. They had arrived later in the day, so despite losing half his men, the Mongols would retreat back to their ships at nightfall, giving Kagetaka and his men some reprieve. So he ordered what was left of them back to his castle. In the castle, they hoped to hold out and protect the women and children until mainland reinforcements could come. By morning, though, they were surrounded by the full landing force and their red-bannered war tugs. The Japanese women would take up arms in an attempt to bolster the defense. But the Mongols shattered the castle's front gate, and with no relief forces having arrived to assist, Kagetaka prepared to lead his men out with a final arrow, assault, and charge. However, when they arrived in the open courtyard, hundreds of their fellow countrymen from the surrounding villages had been tied up into a human shield. In response, some of the Japanese dropped their bows, unsheathed their swords, and charged at the Mongols. Although they were said to have fought valiantly, the Mongols overwhelmed them, and Kagetaka and his family and most of his senior men would commit ritual suicide. All would be slaughtered save one, Kagetaka's daughter, whom he had sent to Dezaif with one of his trusted samurai the day before. The Mongols would next turn their attention towards the main Japanese islands. The Japanese, at the regional seat of government in Dezaif, had already been alerted by messengers of the events in Tsushima and Iki, and surmised correctly that to get there, the Mongols' most likely safe landing spot would be Hakata Bay. Enthusiastic defense preparations were made. Japanese records indicated that in the surrounding nine provinces, horsemen gathered each trying to outdo the other. Shoni Kaneske, the younger brother of the Shugo, would take up defensive positions near the Hachiman Shrine. The Mongol plan was to move eastwards along the coast to Hakata and then turn inland up the river to Dezaif. Accounts state that the pace of the fighting was initiated by the Mongols. They disembarked from their ships, mounted their horses, raised their red war banners, and began their attack as they had the previous two occasions. It was said that the Japanese grandson of one of the commanders loosed a single arrow to initiate combat per tradition. This was said to have been met with raucous laughter from the Mongols. They used tactics that were so unfamiliar to the Japanese, such as advancing on foot in large dense groups protected by shields. The Japanese, meanwhile, had to this point generally fought more as individuals in those war bands, seeking out worthy opponents to accrue glorious accounts of individual prowess. The Mongols quickly secured the heights of the landing areas where the generals gave commands to beat those war drums. These commands indicated whether troops should retreat in times of trouble or advance. The Mongols would also surround prearranged Japanese positions and use their explosive iron and paper balls strategically whenever they advanced or had to retreat. The Mongols pushed through the Japanese at the beach and towards Dezaif. The Japanese preparing to make their last stand at Mizuki Castle, which was the lone buffer left between them and Dezaif. The Mongols would arrive by dusk, of that same landing day, having quickly moved inland. The defenders were under the command of Shoni Kaneske. He managed to shoot a senior Mongol commander who was said to have been over six and a half feet tall or 2.1 meters, shooting him in the face and capturing his horse. There's speculation that the loss of all these commanders was the reason the Mongols did not push on to Dezaif. The Mongols would instead retreat back to the beaches and the ships, but burning all in their path back, sparing no one. They were estimated to have lost a third of their forces, though. While this would be, from the Japanese point of view, most certainly a victory, we don't know exactly what the Mongol initial plan was. Perhaps it was a hit-and-run raid meant to sow fear and force a capitulation. We've no records of Kublai Khan's reaction to the invasion or how much he knew. What we do know is that the next year, he again sent two envoys to Japan. The envoys, based on records, did not take the most direct route. Perhaps they had some glimpse of what fate awaited them, for they would take two months to arrive, and no sooner would they arrive with their great Khan's message than they would be beheaded. Nothing similar had been recorded occurring to the previous Mongol envoys to Japan. The Khan's hope 
likely that the Japanese were ready to capitulate before a second invasion attempt. But the message that they sent back via the beheadings was one that capitulation would not happen easily. This ends part one. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back in a few days with part two. If you like this video, hit that like button. And if you enjoy content like this but haven't yet, please consider subscribing. Love to have you on board the channel. And as always, till the next video, 